Now, Glenda Allender is going to read our scripture, which is found in Galatians 5, verses 5 and 6. The scripture reading is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 5 and 6. For we through the Spirit eagerly wait for the hope of the righteousness by faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Thank you, Glenda. And now Brian has our, ser our sermon today. As I tell you, when people are willing to work at our church, we work them. Amen. I've got muscles that are atrophying, but not my spiritual ones. Praise the Lord. I uh, have a series in mind, and uh, it's like under construction. And I preached the first one here a while back. In fact, I think it was the first sermon um, I had the privilege to, to offer here on prayer. And I had a nice PowerPoint and everything. I was just thought, wow, you know, I just, I want to do this. And so Brother Dave said, uh, when he and Jeff and I were huddling over the message, he says, hey, I'd like to hear another one out of that series that you, that you said you have. And so I gave them a few choices, and uh, they chose faith. I can't think of a more fitting choice. Uh, because faith is the key that unlocks heaven's storehouses. Prayer also, right? Prayer and faith work together, right? Right? So I probably didn't quote it quite exactly right. I'm a little dyslexic, so I might have got prayer before faith or faith before prayer. But in combination, it's a powerful force in the Christian's life. And so today I want to work uh, with you in opening the scripture because um, the scripture says that faith cometh how? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes to us how? By the, word of God. by the word of God. So how does faith get to us? Well, there's an intermediary there of hearing, right? But it comes from the word of God. Faith comes from the word of God. The problem is a lot of us have uh, this problem called being hard of hearing. No. Could that be? As Christians, we might be a little hard of hearing. And thank God, he's looked into it, and he's provided a solution for that as well. It's called the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's the best hearing aid you can ever get. Never wears out, doesn't have batteries. I know I have two, two people in my family that depend on hearing aids, okay? And I can just tell you, the Holy Spirit, that's a hearing aid we all wish was on the market, but it's free. It's free. God offers it to all of us, free. And through it, when we hear things, we can compare them to the Word of God. And if it's so, we're empowered to live it. And if it isn't, we're empowered to reject it. That's wonderful, isn't it? The power God's given us already. Well, let's, uh, let's open God's word, and as we do so, let's do it in prayer. Gracious Father, today, as we open your word, we ask that we would be given a greater portion of faith. For Jesus said that if we had just faith amount of a grain of mustard seed, we could move mountains. And Lord, it seems to me that I need an electron microscope to see the faith that I have. And so Lord, I hope you will grow it today and every day to where it might become a tangible, visible witness of how you've acted in our lives. I pray for each person here that's uh, at church, those that are online, those who may watch this at a later time, I ask for a measure of faith for them as well. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. I used to have a really, really, really good memory. I don't know what's happened to it, but just like the hairs on my head, it's kind of gone. I'm wondering if, like Samson, he had strength, but for me it was my memory, and as I lost my hair, I lost my memory. You know? But um, I will do the best I can here. And so what I find sometimes, uh, and it's also part of my occupation as an instructional trainer, uh, to find ways to help people remember things. Okay? So m my task is like, for instance, in eight hours to tell and train an emergency room doctor how to put all the things he needs to know and write and, 
and prescribe and all that, how he can put that in the computer. And I have eight hours to do it. At the end of the eight hours, I have told him so much, I, I, I'm amazed that they remember anything. But I have found that by using stories, illustrations, um, other kinds of things, helps them remember it. And so today, in the message about faith, I want to take the word faith and each letter of the word faith and give you a little phrase that can help you hopefully remember what it is that I'm trying to share with you today. That's the takeaway. It isn't, it isn't me. I'm not the takeaway. The takeaway is whatever God's impressing on you, and I hope you'll get something from this message. So if you want to jot it down, that's fine. It's nothing, you know, earth-shaking. Uh, I don't need to copyright it or anything. It's Okay? So it's the letters of faith. F-A-I-T-H. Faith. So the first letter, F, is the word forsaking. Forsaking. All right? Forsaking. All right? Now, we'll take our time. You don't, don't have to, you know, write real fast here. No, no speed writing. Okay? Forsaking. How is forsaking related to faith? How is forsaking related to faith? I thought faith is where, you know, we, we connect ourselves, right? Not disconnect. But you can't have faith unless you disconnect from all the things that aren't working in life. Jesus said, let's forsake your mother, your father, the things around you. Take up your cross and follow me. To him, that was discipleship, right? Forsaking your, all that you have. What did he ask of Peter? Leave your nets and follow me, right? And Christ asks the same thing of all of us. He asks for forsaking. A. The A stands for all. Forsaking all. All right? Faith requires that we put everything on the line, that we're all in. Right? If we're not all in with faith, we don't have faith. We have to be all in. The letter I is just that, I, me, myself, personal. Faith, I can only operate with faith if it's my faith. Right? If Carolee has a lot of faith, I can't get anywhere with her faith. I can only get somewhere with my faith. As much as she might want to share what faith she has with me, it still comes down to my faith. The letter T stands for trust. What's interesting is embedded in the word trust are two very important letters, U.S. It's a relationship. It's a two-way street. It's God and me together that builds my faith, all right? And H, with a capital H, him. Now, if we read down through the acrostic, what does the phrase say? Forsaking all, I trust him. Does that make sense? And so I share that with you so that when you think of faith, you think about what faith is really all about. Now, the, uh, I could sit down right now, we could have a closing hymn, and uh, I would think that you've got the message, all right? But um, some might be disappointed. You know, traditionally, we, we weary the saints, and we go as long as we possibly can uh, on this. So I wanted to give it all to you right up front. So those of you who tend to kind of, your attention kind of shortens out, okay? You got the meat of the message already, okay? So now all I'm going to do is just hang a little bit of information on those. Uh, forsaking is uh, the first part, forsaking all. I want to turn your attention to the book of Matthew. Did you know that Jesus tried to have 13 disciples? You ever hear that story about the 13th disciple? Yeah, Jesus actually invited another disciple. Unfortunately, he turned him down. So we're going to read about it. It's in um, Matthew, 
And it's in the 19th chapter of Matthew. Now, Jesus was having a really wonderful time. He uh, had children's Sabbath school. Now, I know Carol Lee said, I'm a workhorse and you're really working me today, and I did Sabbath school. Jesus did children's Sabbath school, and then he preached church. Okay? So this is not a first. Okay? Um, Jesus did that. In verse 13, it says, Then there were there brought unto him little children that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples did what? Rebuked them. No, 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 that's not, that's not part of church. No, no children's story in church. No, no, no. Takes too much time. We need, we need to hear the preacher. Okay? But what did Jesus say? Verse 14. But Jesus said, Suffer or allow the little children, and forbid them not to come unto me. For of such is what? Wow. In other places, he says, unless you become like little children, right? Unless you become like little children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Are you feeling a little childish today? God says that we need to be his children, right? And that as we become like children, we can enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember in that acrostic that I gave you? What was the T for? Trust. What did children do? Little children? They trust. They trust their parents, especially. And one thing we have to watch in these days is they'll trust about anybody, and not everybody's out for their good. Is that right? So we have to look out for them because they are so trusting. And it isn't until they get older that that trust wears off. They get hurt. They uh, get, what's the word, jaded, right? They get to the place where things aren't what they thought it was going to be. The world's not such a wonderful place. Not everybody loves me like my mom or my dad, if they have a dad in the home. Right? Not everybody loves me that way. And they start to feel the scars and the pain that sin causes. And they find it hard to trust. But if you take the letter T out of the word faith, you don't have faith. Right? You got gibberish. You got nothing. Right? So Jesus said, become like children and don't forbid them. Right? Don't make them callous. Don't let them feel like they don't belong, that God doesn't love them, that he doesn't care for them. In fact, the wisdom from Solomon in Proverbs says, train up a child in the way they should go. And when they get old, the Hebrew says, and this is what I like. The Hebrew, in its true meaning, says they can't escape it. It doesn't mean that they won't turn their back on it like the prodigal son did, right? But all the time that prodigal son was feeding pigs and doing all those other things, what was in his mind? The love of his father, right? The love of his father. And his father had loved him in such a way that he even knew that with all the things he had done to hurt his father, his father still loved him. Church, God is your heavenly father, and he loves you even more than that. He loves you even more than that. All right. And what did he do after he, after he rebuked his disciples? for rebuking the children. He laid his hands on them and departed thence. And behold, verse 16. Behold, here's the story of the 13th disciple. Behold, one came and said to him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I might have eternal life? And Jesus immediately said to him, Why do you call me good? There's none good but one. That is God. Now, did you notice what Jesus did right there? He asked a question. Why are you calling me good? And then he gave a response, a typical response, that the only things that can be good is God, right? The ultimate of good is God. So what's the implication here? If you're calling me good, what are you calling me? You're calling me God. Are you ready to do that? 
Do you see the point? Are you going to acknowledge what I say that I, I am and who I am and why I'm here? Which was not what the Pharisees and the scribes were saying about Christ. In fact, they were saying the opposite. The fact that he claims that is because he's from the devil, right? The opposite, total opposite of God. And then Jesus doesn't even give the young man a chance to, like, say something at this point. He said, why are you calling me good? Only God is good. But if you would enter into life, so Jesus just kind of like takes the assumption that because you called me good, you must understand that I'm God. And because you're asking me, right, I'm going to go ahead and give you the answer. I'm just assuming that you're, you know I'm God, and so now I'm going to give you God's answer. If you would enter into life, keep the commandments. That's it. If you would enter into life, keep the commandments. Seems pretty simple. How many of you think you, you could do that? Oh, come on. Any hands? Any hands? You can keep the commandments? Oh, good. I see all of you have studied your Bibles. All right? No. But what did the young man do? He raised his hand. And he said, which one? Which commandments are you talking about? Now, do you think the young man knew which commandments Jesus was talking about? Yeah, I think he did. But he felt a lacking in his life. What was that he was missing? What he was missing was faith. He wasn't quite sure that Jesus was who he said he was. He wasn't quite sure what the commandments were leading him to. If he did know, he didn't really... Um, feel like he was ready to make that commitment. And so what did Jesus say? Now, Jesus skipped four commandments here. When you look at the list, he skipped the first four. Why do you think he did that? The first four commandments. Uh, I remember when I was learning in Sabbath school, God's Ten Commandments, the first four are about our relationship to who? to God. The last six are a relationship to man, right? So Jesus didn't focus on the young man's relationship with God. Isn't that interesting? He didn't say that you're lacking something with your relationship to God. Why do you think he did that? But see, he said, if you would enter into life, keep the commandments. And then the young man said, which ones? Jesus didn't point to the first four commandments. There are many of us today that call ourselves Christians, that live a good life, that have an understanding of what it means to have a relationship with God. And that's a personal thing. It's interesting that Jesus didn't focus first on that relationship because he wanted to show the young man where his problems were. Okay? Where your problems were. If, God, if he would have pointed to the first four commandments, the young man would have never addressed the real root of his problems. Yeah, root of problems. Uh, there's somebody that says that a lot. But uh, the root of the problem, the root problem, what is it? Sin, isn't it? And so he said, look, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and your mother, love your neighbor as yourself. Now it's interesting today, in today's world, most of our fellow Christians, in fact many people who aren't even Christians, have no problem supporting those things that Jesus just read off. Right? Don't murder. Lives matter, right? Don't murder. And people are appalled today because in America right now, the murder rate is soaring through the roof. 
More and more people are being murdered. It was interesting, I saw um, an interview with the president of El Salvador. Somebody was interviewing him. El Salvador, here a few years back, uh, was the worst place to live in the world if you wanted to live to see tomorrow. The murder rate in El Salvador was outrageously high. But church, that president of El Salvador pointed out that the murder rate in Chicago is higher than the murder rate in El Salvador. That's how bad things have gotten here in our country. New York City, I mean, all the big cities. But you know, it's not just stopping there. We're finding it all over the country. Thou shalt not murder. So a lot of people would agree with that. You would think that, um, again, the young ruler was not a murderer, so he didn't have a problem with that. So I'm sure he was kind of scratching his head a little as Jesus read down this list of things that he needed to do, the things he needed to keep. So think about it. Thou shalt not murder. But in Christ's context, what did that mean? Does that mean don't pull out a gun and shoot somebody? Or does it also mean don't assassinate somebody's character? What do you think? So perhaps this young ruler hadn't actually pulled the trigger on anybody. Well, they didn't have guns then to use the knife or the spear, but maybe he had helped collude because that was a common thing in those days. If you didn't like somebody, you just hired somebody to take them out, right? Or you paid somebody to do it. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Don't steal. And the young man said to him, verse 20, all these things have I kept from my youth up. It's almost like he's saying, come on, Jesus, you can do better than that. I'm a fine, upstanding, good person. You can come up with something better than that. Because he says, but what lack I yet? I've done all that. What does it take to get to the next step? Get to the next level? How do I get myself better? What was Jesus' response? Jesus said unto him, if thou wilt be perfect. And I know some people, that perfect is, is, a, is a bad word. You know, if you want to talk about perfection, you're talking, it's a bad word, right? Uh, some want to change that to be complete, okay? All right, if you want to be totally complete in your life, I'll, I'll use that. Jesus said, if you want to be totally complete in your life, Go and sell what you have, give to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven. And what is the next five words? And come and follow me. Isn't that what he said to Peter and Andrew, James and John? Here he's inviting this young man to come and be one of his disciples. Jesus was willing to have 13 or 14 or 15. It wasn't the number so much that was important to Christ, as the relationship. God's calling all of us to be his disciples. He wants us to be able to and willing to make that commitment. And many of us are living good lives. As far as I know, I haven't murdered anybody. Right? Stolen anything from anybody. But yet, in reality, if I could see through the eyes of God, maybe I have in ways that aren't so literal, right? But God is calling us to do the same. What is it that was most important to this young man? He could let go of most, but not all. I remember many years ago, they, when posters were a big deal in the workplace, some of you might remember, you know, you put, they had put inspirational posters up, right? And this one that they had in the break room um, was of this little kitty cat hanging on for its dear life on a little twig, and you're assuming it's like a cliff or something, right? That this little kitten is just holding on for dear life. And uh, I remember having a conversation with a coworker about that. Wow, that poor cat. But everybody knows cats land on their feet, right? So what's it worrying about, right? 
And then we kind of looked, and, and we saw that the cat had like, I don't know, four or five claws on its, on its paw that was holding on. And so we kind of had this little joke that we would say to each other, is it a five-finger day or a three-finger day or a one-finger day? How are you holding on, right? What kind of day is it for you? How many fingers? Okay. So oftentimes for us, it's the same kind of concept, right? It's like, I got to hold on to things. I've got to hold on to something, right? We're afraid to be in free fall spiritually. And so we're always grabbing for something instead of letting go and letting God take care of it, right? Because God has promised you'll land on your feet, right? There's no temptation that he'll allow to come to you or me that he doesn't also make a way of escape. The problem is we paint ourselves in a corner, don't want to walk across fresh paint to the door that he's provided. We're looking for another way out. How about the window here? I'll tell you right now, if we had to exit this room, it's safer through the door than it is through that window. Okay? Just saying. But we look for all these other alternatives, all these other possibilities, instead of trusting God. You cannot have faith until you're willing to forsake all and follow him. As long as there's something in your life that you want to hold on to, as long as somehow in your life you feel like, I'm not such a bad person, you'll never have faith. The disciples walked around and followed Jesus. In fact, the disciples, didn't they also heal the sick? Jesus sent them out two by two, didn't he? And they went out and about. But there were some that they just they couldn't do, right? Uh, somebody had, was possessed of, of uh, demons, right? And they couldn't cast them out. In fact, people were kind of upset. Hey, Jesus, your system doesn't work too good because your disciples aren't really kind of being very effective here. Isn't that kind of a common complaint in the world today? Why people don't want to sign up with Jesus? Well, your disciples, look, they're kind of defective out there. They're not really kind of pulling their weight. They're not up to speed. If they can't do it, why should I join? When you realize that it's not about them, it's about him, right? Forsaking all, I trust him. Think about Peter when he climbed out of that boat. The waters were raging all around, right? He climbs out of that boat. He forsook everything that was behind him, right? And he had his eyes on Jesus, and what did he do? He walked on water. I only walk on water, water in Michigan in the wintertime, okay? That's the only time I can walk on water. But Peter did it in a raging storm, right? How did he do it? Faith. Forsaking all, I trust him. Not just anybody, I trust him. And as long as his eyes were focused on Jesus, and he wasn't thinking about anybody or anything else, he solely was focused on Christ and trusted Christ that when Jesus said, come on out here, that Christ had the power to take care of him. And out he went. But what happened to Peter? The same thing that happens to a lot of Christians, sad to say. We start out trusting God and having faith, and wow, this, what a wonderful experience this is. And then we take our eyes off, just for a fleeting second. We get diverted. Just any little thing, it doesn't really matter, right? You know, for Peter, um, Spirit of Prophecy says he, he looked back at the buddies in the boat. Hey, look at, look at me, what I'm blah, 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 doing. Right? Sometimes we as Christians can do that very same thing. We really get rolling, and man, I'm really, really on fire, and then the next thing you know, it's like, blah, 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 right? Because we took our eyes off Christ. Because we're comparing ourselves to other people. Or because we're thinking that, you know, look at me, hey, look what I'm doing, isn't this great? Okay? Faith requires us to forsake everything, including our own sense of pride, our own senses of accomplishment, right? Paul said, chief of sinners. He labeled himself the chief of sinners, the least of all the disciples. 
Most of the New Testament is written by or involved with the life of who? Well, Jesus and then Paul, right? Right? I mean, how much do we read about Thomas after he kind of had his doubting experience? Not very much. What about Bartholomew? Or Thaddeus? Now, that's not to say that those disciples weren't active and involved in doing things. Right? The story was about Paul. And yet, Paul always considered himself the least of the apostles. Right? The least. Forsaking all, I trust him. Sometimes we trust in other things. Our knowledge of the scripture, you know, some great dynamic minister. You know, there's always somebody we kind of look up to. I remember there was a time in my life in the 1970s and 80s where there was a lot of turmoil and dialogue and discussion in the Adventist church over what constituted righteousness by faith. A lot of talking about faith, but not a lot of faith being shown. Instead, a lot of diatribes and finger pointing and name calling was going on. I don't, some of you may have been here through those years and you might recall how, how that was. And people tended to kind of vacillate towards certain things. There were certain ministers that, oh boy, you know, this guy's telling it like it is. Boy, he's being Elijah. He's standing up to all the corruption in the church, whatever that would happen to be, right? Um, In California, where I was at the time, uh, you had to pick between um, a Desmond Ford or, um, I don't know, some of those independent ministers, Colin Standish or somebody like that, right? both of which were Australians, okay? But they obviously didn't see things exactly the same, and people would pick sides, right? Well, I, I, I agree with Dr. Ford. Well, I agree with Dr. Standish. Or, or let's, go, let's go to a particular retreat where they have it all. You know, they've got it all figured out. But I found quickly that no matter where you went, there was no, you know, island of paradise in a world of... Uh, turmoil, right? That when you'd go to some of these places, it wasn't quite what some people hoped it would be or thought it would be or, or tried to portray it as. And I'm saying on all sides, okay? Um, I know for myself, it was very discouraging to stay in the church when there's all of that rancor going on. But again, who am I looking to? Forsaking all of that, I trust in him. Our eyes have to be above this world, folks, because we're not going to find anything in this world. And the only way we will find our way into the next world is by faith. And what does faith mean? Forsaking all, I trust him. I, I want to point us here for a few minutes to the book of Hebrews. I would be remiss if I preached on, on faith and didn't visit Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This is called, you know, the faith chapter, and it starts right out with a definition of faith, right? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, oftentimes the word faith is misunderstood as being equivalent to, or the same as, or juxtaposed with the term believe, right? So when we refer to our church, we say my faith, right? Our faith, right? Uh, Some churches uh, refer to their beliefs as a summary of faith, right? These are things I believe in, and that's my faith. But friends, it isn't about those statements of belief that constitute faith. You can't go down through the 28 or 29 or however many they have. They'll have 30 here before we know it. It doesn't matter how many of those line items there are that we check the box and say, yeah, I believe that. Yeah, I got that. Yeah, I understand that. You can get to the bottom of that list, checked all the boxes, and you're just like that rich young ruler. But what lack I yet? See, it isn't about knowledge. Faith is not even about believing. Because John says even the devils believe. 
Okay? But it's the connection. You look out in the parking lot, there's cars out there. How many of you believe that those cars, uh, if you do the right thing, you can get in them and they'll take you just about anywhere you want to go? Everybody kind of believe that? Okay? How many of you are going to get to Raleigh today if you don't get in one of those and start it and actually drive it? So while the car has potential out there sitting in the lot saying, hey, you know, I'll take you wherever you want to go, it needs a driver and it needs somebody to turn it on and operate it. Faith is the same way. It's not the car. It's the experience. It's the practical aspect of getting in it and driving it. All right? So I forsake everything else. I trust God. When I start the car, I trust it's going to start. When I put it in gear, I presume it's going to go where I want it to go, right? And when I look at the gauges, I trust them, right? That what they say, you know, I got a full tank or I don't, right? That's the experience of faith. Righteousness comes by experience, not just belief. Do you think that uh, Abraham believed God when he promised him in the covenant that I'll make your offspring like the sands of the sea? But he didn't have faith. He had belief. And that belief led him to the Hagar situation, right? And some of the other things that happened. That's what belief did for him. That's what his personal faith did for him. But when Jesus said to him, take that Isaac, that promised miracle, and you go out there and you sacrifice him. Belief became what? Faith. In the process. Do you know that Abraham in that story illustrated more clearly than anything else what God did for us? Abraham got as close as you possibly can to actually being God saying John 3.16, for God so loved the world, right? That he gave his only begotten son. Now God stopped him, right? Because Isaac was not the Messiah. But in that story of what happened with Abraham and Isaac, all of Israel through the Old Testament had a very visible picture of what faith amounts to of what God was wanting to do for them, each one, individually and collectively. And you know that same plan applies today. That same opportunity is ours. And the only way that we're going to move beyond here is if we will accept that kind of a relationship and have that kind of faith. So what else did he say here? He says, through faith, verse 3, we understand the worlds were framed by the word of God. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that brought into question today? Right? So that things which are seen were not made of things that appear. Now, if that one verse by itself doesn't tell you that evolution is baloney, I don't know what other Bible text you can point to unless you want to go to Genesis 1 and try to make the argument. But Paul just summarizes it right here. What we see around us was not sprung out of other things that we see. God created it. He put it into existence. All right? Um, then he talks about um, Enoch in verse 5. He was translated, should not see death, and was not found because God translated it. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Okay, so God liked him. Maybe he was good looking. Right? Maybe he had a nice manner about it. Is that why God liked him? Is that what pleased God about Enoch? No, because the next verse explains it. For without faith, it is what? Oh, come on now. Impossible to please God. If faith was just a belief, and that's all God wanted us was to believe he exists, and believe he sent Jesus, and that's it, he'd be happy. But that's not what he's looking for. He's looking for faith. Does, does that make sense to you this morning, the difference between those? For without faith, it's impossible to believe him. 
For he that comes to God must first believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that what? Diligently do what? Seek him. Not diligently believe him, but who actually put that into practice. Our, our text um, this morning, our memory text, uh, or spiritual text for the message, talks about righteousness by faith in Galatians, and it talks about the faith that works by love. Ellen White referred to a message uh, that was given to the Adventist church in the year 1888 in a town called Minneapolis. Isn't it interesting how Minneapolis seems to always kind of pop up somewhere when things happen, right? In Minneapolis. And there was a rejection of that message by many. Not all, but by many. Okay? And Ellen White referred to that message as, and she quoted from Galatians, a faith that works by love, and she added a few additional words, and purifies the soul. And to her, that was the summary of what righteousness by faith is, a faith that works by love and purifies the soul. Let's look at that really quickly. Faith that works. Do you want something that's ineffective? Right? If you have a problem and you need to fix it, are you interested in me telling you about a bunch of stuff that's not going to work? Are you going to buy it from me? Well, I might spin it in a way, and you might try it, but if you already know in your heart of hearts it's not going to work, why would you spend money on it, right? Why would you... Why would you even mess with it, right? There's a lot of people out there preaching about faith. But if it's not the kind of faith that works, is it faith you want? It's not faith I want. Why spend my time on things that aren't going to work? I want something that's, wor- that's going to work. And God says that if we have the faith, Jesus said if we had the faith like this grain of mustard seed, we could move mountains. That's how powerful it is. And of course, he was giving an example, Right? You don't need a lot of faith. But if you'll start to have an experience with God, it's amazing the mountains in your life that will be, that will be moved. You know, I sang a song a few, few weeks back about, got any mountains? You know, you think, or I cross the bowl, got any rivers? You can't, whatever, right? Okay? So there's the context. You get a little bit of faith. Real faith. Practical faith. And it moves mountains in your life. It changes your life forever. Faith that works. And what is it doing? Once you use faith, it starts to do something. Okay? I remember as a kid in chemistry class, um, the, the chemistry teacher said, now you take a little bit of this sulfuric acid and you pour it in here, but be very careful because it doesn't take very much and it starts to work just like that. Okay? And all kinds of things would happen, you know. But just once you start the process, it just goes, right? A faith that works, that's effective. And how does it work? A faith that works by love. Love is the power, okay? Faith that works by love. And what is the end result? You know, if I said, hey, take this and this and this, pull them all, pour them all together, And you're going to get a product. And you go, okay, that's great. Now, what does it do? You know, what am I supposed to do with this? It's great. I made all this nice stuff. What do I do with it? The same thing spiritually. A faith that works by love and purifies the soul. The end result of faith is purity, perfection, completeness. Okay? Faith the character of Christ. So how do we get that? A faith that works by love. And as we allow the love of God to work in our life, as we have that loving relationship with him, our faith grows, and so does the end result. Does that seem simple enough? Oh, I hope this morning, church, that you get the concept. I could... There's a lot more. I just want to turn you towards Scripture. Do a concordance search of the word faith and just read those passages. And I guarantee you by the, by the fifth verse that you looked up, you're going to feel inspired. You're going to feel empowered. Your life is going to feel a whole lot easier. And your hope will be so much greater. And that's only just 
the first five verses, okay? There's many, many more. Faith is all through the Bible. Read this chapter in Hebrews. And many, I could turn to many other things here, but I didn't want you guys to uh, get lost in all the verses. All right? So, if you didn't write it down yet, if you feel like you should, F, forsaking, A, all, I, I, myself, T, trust, H, him. If you put that into practice in your life, you will have faith, and it will grow. And you will be able to answer that question that Christ asked rhetorically when he said, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith? on the earth. It's up to you and me. Do we trust him? Are we willing to forsake all and follow him? Let's pray. Gracious Father, this morning, um, I'm not sure I've made this as clear as I could. And Lord, I, I ask your forgiveness for that, but I trust that the Holy Spirit can take these thoughts, these words, and in the hearts of each of us, make them abundantly productive and producing fruit for your kingdom. Lord, if there's anything we lack, it's faith. And so we ask that you will help us look to you, the author and finisher of our faith. These things we ask in Christ's name.